All right, cool. Uh, so we are ready to rock and roll. Um, here's the survey, it's on Piazza. It links to a Google form. It's all totally anonymous. I don't even think there is a place for you to put your name in. Um, the only two actually required are just how's the pace going and how much effort are you putting in. Um, try to be honest with these things too. And then there is a bunch of stuff with just the content. Um, I know it might seem like there's a lot, but they're all just like dialogue boxes. It should take five minutes to go through. Um, a recap of what we did last time. So this is our simple scatter chart. We kind of haphazardly stumbled through our kind of the essentials of D3. And um, we glossed over some things that people have encountered trying to do their projects. And I want to start with um, how I would approach creating a visualization from scratch on my computer with a text editor that's not JSBin and how to load external data files. Um, also gonna talk about things like legends and um, go through, so did, did folks, um, look at the project page in the last two days. Um, so I updated the project page just with a, a bit more context around, I guess, what's what's expected. Um, so this is a visualization I did with um, these Airbnb listings from inside Airbnb. Um, this is for San Francisco. On the X, we have neighborhoods. And on the Y, we have the number of listings in each of those. And then it's broken down by, is it a shared room, a private room, or the entire home? This, I would say, is probably the harder or hardest chart to create that I might expect someone would do. Um, so this is a stacked bar chart. Sometimes you see stacked area charts. Um, which are basically this, but with line charts. Um, mainly they're, they're tough because of the way that D3 handles these. But in terms of what I am expecting for the project, um, the three requirements for part two of create your own visualization, it's one, there needs to be some dimension or column that is categorical. And this is what in this one, um, this is a different view of the same listings. Categorical meaning um, it's some facet that you can group the data by. So the categorical column in here would be the type of listing. Is it private? Is it entire home? Or is it um, shared room? The second two dimensions are actually they can be anything. So you can either have, in this case, continuous on the Y, continuous on the X or you could have categorical on the X, um, like this one. So this is uh, discrete and unordered on the X and continuous on the Y, or you could have something ordinal, you can imagine like time. So you might have time on the X and some continuous value on the Y. Um, so basically discrete or, or continuous on the X and Ys, and then some sort of grouping, which you can create a legend from. Um, and then outside of that, you can do whatever you want with whatever data set you want. Um, and what's expected is something either, this is probably the easiest to do, is a colored scatter plot. Um, this is probably the hardest to do in D3, which is stacked area chart. And then the other one that's probably one of the uh, more common, uh, if you go to here, if you go to examples, there's a multi-line chart. So this is the other type that I would expect people to do. So this is if you have time on the X, continuous on the Y, there's three different lines, each a different color. Um, and you're not limited to those three, but those are the three most obvious that aren't gonna take uh, like 
inordinate amount of time to do. If you want to do something more custom, that's totally awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it it doesn't really um it doesn't really matter one way or the other depending on where you do the grouping. So the um the two approaches, you can either have it be something that's um very long and then there's this function uh which is a little bit more advanced um d3 nest which basically groups by a given label um so you can do the grouping uh with this or the other one if you have y data where each column represents let's say like a neighborhood um then you can just do the selection within your D3 um, accessor functions, if that makes sense, I guess. Yeah, yeah, so... So I actually really like using Nest, but we're not going to cover it today, and we're probably not going to cover it until... Thursday or next Monday. Um, so I would say do it um, in the wide format for now and aggregate it in Python or R and then just like get your data in the right format before you upload it. Um, yeah, it, it's whatever is easier for you. It's like D3 and, and JavaScript JavaScript have conventions, but they're not limiting in any way, which makes it hard for these like best practices to really emerge. Um, and JavaScript's a really flexible language that does strange, strange things. Yeah, so this one they they did it in the uh, the wide format. So each city is a different column, and then they um, Uh, yeah, so in this one, they create three separate, totally separate lines somewhere in here. Uh, the other more practical side of that is whatever example you find, I would try to copy their structure if you don't want to change their code a ton. Yeah, that, that's probably... Yeah, that's, that's, what, that's what you do more often than not until you get comfortable enough and then just like write, write this from scratch without actually looking at an example. Um, I still actually look back at my old charts whenever I create a new one. So I always have like my own personal bank of my own examples to go to. Um, so D3 is, yeah, uh, peculiar in that sense. Um, any other, uh, any other project questions specifically? Um, oh, for today, uh, where is it? So today's um, part one is taking this, which is part one of the project, and turning it into this, which is um, a better representation of this data. And for the project, you actually do something that's, I guess, the inverse. So rather than take the Civic Center rent data and make the visual encoding better, you're taking the bar chart and making the data better for a bar chart for part one. So rather than taking this and making the visual encodings work for this data, 
you're going to find data that works for these visual encodings. Um, one example being something with um, categorical stuff on the X rather than times on the X. And yeah, to do this, I'm actually probably going to not use what we've seen so far and use just a text editor. Um, let me quickly find where this file is. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so you can totally use the same data set for both of them. Um, I will say again, if you do use the data set for part one and you make a bar chart for it, it's, I guess the, <laughs> So the stacked bar chart is actually like a lot harder to do in D3 than something like colored scatter. Um, it's fine if you use the same data, but just like a word of warning, trying to make this bar chart into something that works for part two might be more trouble than it's worth. Um, Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess just a mild word of caution. So for this one, I'm actually going to be using the um, the Atom editor, but you can really use whatever editor you want. Um, Atom editor is GitHub's open source editor that feels a lot like Sublime Text, but I see a lot of people um, who have been working through things in PyCharm, which is, which is totally fine. Um, or whatever your your editor of choice is. Uh, So um, for this one, I'm going to show how I would do part one if I were doing this. Uh, step one of part one. And this also is just like general workflow about blocks conventions. Um, 
So the first thing, whenever you find a chart that you want or you like, um, Blocks doesn't actually let you really do anything to it. This is just like a static presentation of it. If you do want to hack on this in the browser, there's this site um, called Building Blocks. It's actually kind of like JSBin, but specifically for, for D3. And the quickest way to start manipulating a chart is you just change the URL from blocks.org to blockbuilder.org. And it lets you, it basically sucks in the chart and it lets you change things. In this case, let's say the bars are gonna be green. And then it does this like live refresh and it actually gives you, if there's a, if there's a hex code, it gives you really good color picker tools. So if this is like um, a hex code, it gives you something like this, uh, color picker. So you can actually visually experiment with things. Um, so this is a great, just like prototyping tool, block builder. But again, um, it has functionality to fork and save it. Um, but for this leave page, I wanna actually show how to do this um, on your computer persistently. Um, so step one, find the gist that corresponds to this. Um, you do that by clicking on the little thing up here. Um, so if you are still um, need to work on part one, you can follow right along. Um, you click on that, it takes you to the author, in this case, my um, gist. There's a link here that says embed and it has this little drop dropdown. Um, so gists, again, I told you are just these mini repositories. And because they're mini repositories, you can actually clone them. So I actually have, um, does anyone here have SSH keys set up? Does anyone, who here knows what SSH keys are? All right, um, yeah, so GitHub's preferred method of cloning is actually the HTTPS. I, I historically just have SSH keys set up on my computer. So I'm gonna do clone with SSH, but if you have the HTTP, which means you basically put in your username and password on your command line. So if you put in your username and password on your command line, you do HTTP, copy to clipboard. Now that this is copied, we can, in our terminal here, we can basically just do a git clone with that URL. The naming is all kind of strange. Um, but it cloned it, and now, where is it? The directory it clones it into is just a directory with the same hash. Um, so 9233F6 and, and whatnot. Um, now we have the files locally on ours. Um, I'm going to replicate, uh, try to replicate the process of, of forking. Um, so if you have forked it um, here, if you do view fork, uh, Yeah, so for this one, um, you're actually going to be submitting through a fork. So you can either just get things all set and like copy and paste the code into your fork, or you can develop with Git and then just push the code to your fork. So if you are pushing code to your fork, you're going to want to, again, for you, there should be like a fork button here instead of an edit button. 
you're going to go to your fork um, and do the same thing. So you can either clone the original or you can clone your fork. Um, at the end of the day, again, it doesn't matter too much, but your name should be here in the list of forks. This is how I'm going to grade it. And I should be able to view your fork with the updated code. So whichever way you want to get your code there, if you want to copy and paste or if you want to clone it, um, that's totally up to you. Um, but the process is the same. You get the URL and you get it locally in your terminal here. And then in my Atom editor, we can see the files. This is the HTML file. This is the readme file, and this is the data file. Uh, so the data we can see here has quite a lot of headings. So it's like a pretty wide CSV. Um, shouldn't be a problem programmatically, but if you want to get a better sense of just exploring this, you can open it up in your spreadsheet tool of choice. Uh, and my computer, it opens up with LibreOffice uh, for whatever reason. Um, and then this is a good way to just get a sense visually any unusual things. We can see here that there's this really big gap in prices in Excelsior. On every row, we basically have a new month of the year. Every column is the median rent for that neighborhood. Um, Excelsior, there just wasn't a lot of data. Same thing with Parkside. Um, a few other neighborhoods have gaps before it started getting collected. And then um, some have intermediate gaps. So this is, I think, Tenderloin, oh, Central Sunset has just this in-between gap. So those are things that you might notice visually and it always helps to go back and actually verify the quality of the data. Um, So I'm going to actually get in that folder. Um, so now I'm in the 9233, whatever. Um, so this is the folder gist is in. Um, this is the important part. So I'll, I'll, I'll write important things down. I'll also put them in the notes. Um, so step one to actually viewing your file. Uh, so for security purposes, um, Chrome, apparently uh, Safari doesn't do this, but if you open the file with a web browser, you're not going to see anything. Um, so this happens if you double click your HTML file. This happens in terminal. I just did open. And it defaults, since it's an HTML file, to open with a web browser. And something to note is that if you remember our, our earlier lecture on URLs, uh, this is a little hard to see. Uh, I'll copy this and put it in. Adam, uh, so I can enlarge it. So this is the URL, and there's this file colon slash 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 at the start of it. And again, the protocol is pretty important. Um, something that I happened to mention in the slide, um, I mentioned it for this sole purpose. Um, if you do see in your URL file colon slash slash and if nothing's showing up, um, well step one, if nothing's showing up, always go to your Chrome little uh, console. This is the HTML, but to actually see any errors, 
you need to go to console. And does anyone recognize this error? Has anyone seen this error before? Nope. So this is the most common source of not being able to see any visual things, even though all the code is correct. I just showed you on blocks, it rendered correctly. I just cloned it, so nothing has changed. Nothing should be going wrong. Um, what this actually says is XML HTTP request cannot load so-and-so, um, which is what's technically happening. But the more helpful message says cross-origin requests are only supported for protocol schemes, HTTP, data, Chrome, and these other, other things. So again, the protocol is what comes first in that URL. Chrome's helpful and it's saying you can't make a request, in this case, cross-origin, um, meaning you can't request on google.com, cnn.com, due to domain privacy um, and security, unless you go through these other hoops. So this is basically saying, I can't load anything. In this case, I can't load file data.csv because I can't go across the origins because I'm in this file protocol. So the solution to this is to start an HTTP server to actually serve up your files from the HTTP protocol, um, which sounds like a lot of jargon possibly, um, but thankfully for us, there's a very easy solution that you just do. If you don't totally understand what's going on behind the scenes, don't worry. Um, but I'm happy to talk more in depth in office hours after this class. But all you need is a um, any sort of HTTP server. The common one that I use is uh, called Simple HTTP Server. And the reason I use it is that it's packaged with every standard Python install. I assume all of you have Python. Um, and has anyone ever used the dash M flag in Python's command line, Python dash M? <laughs> all right, so there's actually other useful dash M, um, dash M stands for modules. It's this like almost hidden feature of Python. Um, and you can do really powerful things like this, start a web server. So if you do Python dash M simple HTTP server, um, all, so HTTP all capitalized, there's an extra H in there, um, capital S and hit enter. It actually runs this built-in module on your command line. And it says serving HTTP on 0, .0, 0.0.0, which is another, uh, this is the IP of localhost on port 8000. Um, so again, ports, hosts, and protocols all coming back. Um, and to actually see our file, we can now go to oh, localhost colon 8000. Um, and we have our visualization. Um, so that's just a really long winded way of getting your visualization up. Um, other notes of this, so you can run it on other ports. You can run this server on other ports by just appending after simple HTTP server, whichever port you wanna run it on. So if I wanna run it on another port, I can say port 8080, so space 8080, running on port 8080. If you try to run this on a port that's already taken, it's going to complain and, and um, it's not going to work. Since I'm running on a different port, it says I can't load it. 
we go to 8080 and it brings it up. Um, it does in a way um, I'll explain <laughs> so it serves up the files from whichever directory you run it and every directory below that's a great question um, this is blocks naming convention and just web naming conventions number two. Um, so any index.html file is always the default thing that any web server looks for, and it tries to serve it if you're not more specific. So since we didn't say slash, like, whatever, my file .html, it says, you didn't tell me which path to load, so I'm going to try to load index. If it's there, it works successfully. If it's not, it says can't find index. Um, blocks follows the same convention. So when you are using gists with blocks, you need to name your file uh, index.html. And readme is the description if you have one in Markdown. So if you do have a description, name it readme.md for Markdown. And you actually don't need to do any data file naming conventions. It doesn't need to be data.csv. It doesn't need to be a JSON file. It doesn't need to be any specific thing. Um, and that can all be changed with how you write your D3. Uh, so that's getting up and running. Um, questions on this server business? All right, so now uh, workflow number two. Um, so start your server and make sure that you can actually see it. Step two, um, I'll say modify files in editor. And the other, the other mention, um, so loading external data um, is what we're going to talk about. So this is my index file. Um, there's a bunch of like styling that is not super exciting to talk about. Um, I want to try and give you a sense of the layout of the file. Uh, all right. So I'm trying to give you like a 10,000 foot view of the components. So you can't see or read what any of these components are here. But before I dive in, this is our standard head. This is a script tag to load D3. The next big chunk, all stale in the head, is styles. Below the styles is all of my D3 script. So the bulk, by far the bulk of my file is actually all stale in the head. So we're stale in the head. This is all of our D3 code. This is what does all of the drawing. And that goes all the way to line like 160. So this is all just stale in the head. The head gets closed right here. And then this is the body. So just as like a sense of most of this chart is all in D3 in one function in one script tag in the head. And then the body is just two lines of code or three lines of code. 
and we actually load our data right here at the bottom. So this is this um, like inverted pyramid almost of um, how how I write my D3 and is one of the more common conventions is you have head, you have script in the head. This is like all my D3. This is closed script. This is closed head. This is open body. Another script. And then in this script in the body, the only thing you do is actually load data. And call this function we defined. And then uh, close script, close body. And the reason we do this strange um, backwards pattern is again, JavaScript is asynchronous and it does this kind of callback workflow. So instead of in Python, which is more logical, you say do things in the order I write them. In JavaScript, it's a little backwards. In this case, we say load my data or basically define my function and do all this stuff. Once my function's all defined, I'm ready to load my data. So load my data. Once my data's loaded, call my function. Um, and the load the data happens specifically um, in this one call to these special functions in D3 called the data loading functions. And it has functions to load CSVs, TSVs, so tab separate files, and JSON um, just built in. And it actually can load any delimited file format. So if you do have a weird file format, you can either change it with like Python or R and then save a new file, or you can just use D3 to load it in. And the unique thing about this function is the first argument is the file name that your web server will serve up. So if I'm not in the same directory with my Python simple HTTP server, I might have to prepend this with something like a data folder, um, other folder names, slash data. So my data might be nested deeper or it might be somewhere totally different at like a URL. This naming convention actually can load over URLs as well. So if I have an external file that some other site's hosting, I can just load it from my CSV function or my .json function. And these are special because they make one of those Ajax calls. Um, if you remember the like flow of, of how a web page gets loaded, I had that one slide with these two arrows. Then there was a, a back and forth of, I request the page, it responds with HTML, this is the initial page load, and then I ask for more data in Ajax, and it responds with data back. Um, so this Ajax call is what d3.csv does in the background, and the second argument is the name of the function that actually contains all of the JavaScript that draws my function. So here, once the data is fully loaded and in, in um, the web page, only then when it has all of the data, does D3 say call that callback function and pass that callback function all of the data. So this is my function and in here, I defined a function named draw. It takes a single argument. In this case, that argument is just called data. And this is actually the, um, the CSV that gets, gets passed into it. Um,
yeah, so um, as long as whatever you want to connect to can serve the data file over HTTP, it, it can connect to it. Um, so all you need for this is a URL or a file that can be served over an HTTP colon slash slash URL. Um, some databases can do that. Some can't. Um, some libraries can like do that in front of a database. So if you have a Postgres database or a MySQL, I'm sure there's some library where you can just serve up your data tables over HTTP. Um, I don't think Postgres can do it natively. Um, I've never actually connected to anything that's not a flat file hosted on a web server though. So 99.9% .9 of my visualizations have always been some flat file being a CSV or a JSON hosted on some web server. It might be a local web server that I'm running on my laptop, or it might be a web server that's running on some site in the cloud. Question. Yeah, it's it's not necessarily bad form. Um, I think this is the way that the tutorial or book that I learned like way back did it. So then I just got in the habit of it. Um, I say like when in doubt, um, do what Mike Bostock does. Uh, so this might be the most popular block. Um, Mike Bostock. Um, did it. This actually, maybe this one isn't the best example to go to because this was probably the first block he did, but he actually puts his script in the body. Um, so the creator of D3 puts in the body. I put in the head. Choose, choose which. Um, other questions. So this this is probably the most cryptic thing to debug if your visualizations just are blank. Usually, I make sure that the data is always loaded. And um, has anyone used the debugger before? In Chrome or Safari or whatever, the web browser debugger. All right, so this is number three of um, D3 up and running. I'll say like 2.5. And this is a all caps type of statement. Use a debugger. Um, the reason why it's an all caps type of statement is that um, by nature of loading an external file, we have to use a callback function. So there's no way if we want to load a CSV that's of some non-trivial size, we have to write all of our drawing D3 inside of a callback. The side effect of that is that since this is JavaScript and it works like most programming languages, Whenever you create a new function, it creates a new scope. Um, do all of you know, I guess, know what I mean when I say variable scope? And this is the, um, I guess, like second, third peculiar thing about writing your own D3 code without a like built in editor type thing. Um, so if I look here and I say, I have this function, it's called draw. I have this data here. Maybe something looks off in my chart. Let's say that, um, anyways, yeah, let's say something looks off and I'm trying to fix it. And let's say I want to change the padding between the bars. So the space between the bars. 
I go to my code here and I say, here's a variable. I've named it bar padding. So let me actually see what the bar padding looks like in my, my Chrome. So I do bar padding and it says, Bar padding is not defined. I I just copy and pasted it. It is defined. Um, what's what's happening here? Why can't I find that variable that I very clearly have in my code? Mm hmm. So. The, uh, I don't think it's annoying. The thing that people think sometimes when learning D3 that is annoying is this function definition draw hides all of the internal variables. So I can't actually like interactively explore them. Some people use console logs a lot. They do like console.log like margin, but if you do this, you basically have to like refresh the page to see any debugger statements. Oh, this is not my file. This is the index. Uh, what's happening? So this is what the debugger does um, for reference. If anyone in your code, this isn't an Atom thing. This isn't a Chrome thing, I don't think. Um, I think it works in other browsers. I actually haven't verified. But if you put debugger as a keyword with a semicolon, it's actually a JavaScript keyword that puts you in the debugger as long as you're um, web console's open. So as long as my web console's open, it stops the execution and we can see nothing is actually getting drawn. Um, if it's not open, if I close this, it basically runs the code. Um, and nothing is showing up, uh, which means, oh, I totally, uh, yeah, so you don't you don't want to do that if you have a local data file. If you have a local data file, you can just put the the file name. Um, so again, if I don't have my console open, the debugger doesn't actually catch; it just breezes past it. If I have my console open, I refresh the page; it pauses it here. And the very special thing about pausing it here is that now I have a way to actually explore what these variables are because I'm inside of this function scope. If I type data, I can see I have all of these objects. Um, a point of note, no matter which format of data you load, D3 automatically converts it into an array so this is an array of JSON objects. So the preferred D3 data structure is an array of JSON objects. Internally, this .csv function does all the heavy lifting of turning a CSV into an array of JSONs, which is actually a very non-trivial thing to do. Um, and in here, we can see every column gets added as a, um, as a property name. So if I do want to look at one of these, I can say data zero. So what's data zero? Data zero corresponds to a given month. And I can do dot month here. And I can say the first data point corresponds to February 2010. Um, and then a, a little trick that um, I really like. And it, analog to console.log is console.table. So if you do console.table, it actually gives you a spreadsheet in your Chrome console. So we have a spreadsheet here. And the interesting thing is you can actually sort these. So you can sort columns and do like 
some minor debugging and spreadsheet type editing. Um, but again, it's very uh, low powered. Um, so that's, uh, that's getting, getting set up. Um, I will, uh, I will break, uh, you can take a break in like a minute, um, get some water, go to the bathroom for five minutes. I'll field questions. Um, but before we take a break, um, has anyone run into just difficulties getting their code into a form where they can really quickly edit it and explore it? Um, have people been doing something similar to this? Raise your hand if you've been using a text editor and some form of what I just showed. And I guess raise your hand if you've been using just one of those online editors um, like JSBin or, or Block Builder. All right, the other, the other thing I sometimes do is when I'm doing just a really rapid stuff, I would do it in like JSBin or Block Builder. And then once it looks close to what I want, I do the like fine tuning and like more, I guess, specific things in an editor. Um, and then the... Uh, The last just mention on this. Um, so we did talk about data last time, um, but we used this fake data. The fake data looked very similar to our real data. It was just an array of JSON. Um, but for reference, here's the data bind. Um, the convention, if that argument to my draw function is called data. That's where all of my array of JSONs lives. And then I just pass that array of JSONs to my dot data function. So if you are doing this with a different data file, you don't actually need to change any of the variable stuff um, up until this point. You just would change the contents of data.csv or just make a new file with, with your data and then the place where um, you need to do some, some tweaks is basically on the, um, the column names. So in this bar chart, there's a few places where I reference field, which corresponds to the column I'm loading. And then also a few places that reference like month. So this is a specific attribute of those JSON objects. Um, and this happens to be in um, the scaling functions and also in some of the draw functions for, for the bars here. Um, so in these attribute accessors, we can see we have things like D field, um, measure scale, measure scale height. Um, those are probably gonna change uh, these, uh, these things to work with your data. Um, the plus. Uh, so the plus is JavaScript's way, I think I might have mentioned this, is JavaScript's way of doing um, string to numeric conversion. So if you have string seven um, and you want to make it number seven, you do plus number seven. Um, the reason you see this disproportionately in D3 code is that D3 loads every data file as strings. So D3 doesn't do any sort of type inference to say this column looks like it's numbers. It just says, I'm not even gonna bother. I'm gonna let the programmer explicitly tell me that this is numeric or this is a string in a category or this is a date. Yeah, so with that, uh, let's take a five-minute break, and uh, yeah, come back at 4.20, 
uh, yeah, 420. And then we'll go and do the kind of quick conversion of this into this. And then once we've done that, I'll, I'll talk through things like legends and color scales and, and all of that good stuff.